Welcome to the second lecture of the class, which is for Chapter 2, Systems Administration, Part 1. You can go ahead and find this particular lecture on pages 26 through 49 of your textbook. So, agenda for today will be the same one that we had uh, last, last lecture for the last chapter, and this is the way that we'll do it for all of the chapters and all of the lectures, is that first we'll review the last lecture and chapter in review and see how it links in with what we're going to be talking about today. Second, we will be going over the lecture and chapter objectives. What are the main key points that I want you to take out from this particular chapter? Third, I'll get into the lecture itself. And then fourth, I'll summarize some of the review questions that are critical for you to know that can also help you out for the quiz associated for this chapter. So just to summarize, uh, last lecture, we talked about information security as a whole. We talked about you know, what information security is, the major components of it. Uh, you know, we're trying not to get our information destroyed, stolen, messed with in any way, shape, or form. We talked about the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and we provided examples for each of those as well. Then we talked about some of the most important skills that an information security professional is expected to have. We talked about it from both a technical point of view as well as a non-technical point of view. So from a technical point of view, adding in things such as uh, systems administration or Linux skills, cryptography, you know, that, that type of thing, so on and so forth. And then from a non-technical point of view, really having an aspiration to continue to learn and grow throughout your career, learn new technologies, have a positive attitude, think like a black hat hacker and that type of thing. We talked about some of the activities that uh, many information security professionals spend most of their time, such as researching technologies, implementing new technologies, doing a lot of non-technical work throughout their, throughout their work. And then we also talked about some of the strengths as information security as a career choice. You know, it has a, has a great upside in terms of salary, in terms of job security, and that type of thing. Today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, a particular role that's been seen within IT over the last 30 or 40 years, but really has become very important within the context of information security, and that's a systems administration. We're going to identify exactly what systems administration is and how it relates within information security. So we, we had a great definition of what information security is last lecture. We talked about the different components of information security. One of the key people that's associated within information security is a systems administrator. And they're oftentimes the first line of defense within an organization for cybersecurity. And for many organizations, they're the only line of defense for security. We're going to summarize some of their common tasks that they engage in. We'll identify some of the systems administration facilities that are provided by enterprise software. Specifically, what are the different types of tools that are available to systems administrators to help them execute their tasks, both in their main job role as administering systems, but also in information security. We'll also summarize the value of what virtualization is for administ systems administrators, and we'll define exactly what virtualization is as well. Think about uh, an enterprise level organization. They often have tens of thousands of machines on their networks. There has to be a systematic way of handling all of those machines. And then we'll summarize the major operating systems that systems administrators often have to deal with, namely Linux, Mac, and Windows. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of recalling from the last lecture. Remember that information security is protecting information and information systems from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, or disruption in order to provide confidentiality, integrity, and availability, CIA. And this is a really a definition that you'll see all over the all over government, DHS, NSA, that type of thing. Now, this is all good and well, but we need to clearly identify who within an organization is best suited to undertake these tasks. And if you really break down the characteristics of who would be the best suited, you'd think about they would have to have a good understanding of the information assets or the information that the organization is providing, the systems the end business needs, the type of software that's being used, the people within the organizations, who gets access to what, and that type of thing. Here's where a systems administrator comes into play. A systems administrator, or a sysadmin, is the person responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of a technology system, and in many cases, many technology systems. And the value for information security is that it's the first line of defense. They secure critical information systems. They're responsible for writing, enforcing, and reviewing security operating procedures. 
Two little uh, anecdotes that I have for you. One is that I actually served as an admi systems administrator from 2013 to 2014, and I was responsible for managing what was known as the microwave lab at the University of Arizona within the Management Information Systems Department. In the microwave lab, I was responsible for managing 53 workstations where individuals could come in, install software, and use those computers for uh, for their class related content. Additionally, I was also responsible for managing all of the servers that classes were required to use for their projects. So for example, you may have a database class and as part of your database class, you're required to do some sort of a uh, querying assignment. You're required to develop some sort of SQL queries or, and that type of thing. Well, I was responsible for making sure that the database that hosted the server was up, it was available, the data was confidential to those people. The, the integrity of the data wasn't messed with in any way, shape, or form. And more importantly, for those students that were doing the assignments at 11.50 p.m., right before the due date, I had to make sure that that server was up and available for them to use. The second story I want to tell you about is that it's really related to my father's uh, company when he had a company for 12 years. In his company, he had a, a very lean business model. He had only about five or six employees, but he relied heavily for technology, and he was a, uh, a civil engineer. And in, in those uh, databases that he had, he had many specs of bridges and roads and that type of thing, really, really important infrastructure for society today. So he hired a systems administrator that could really help him do a couple things, make sure that he had a website that was up and available for people who were interested in getting his consulting services, and then also making sure that the data that was stored in those databases wasn't compromised in any way, shape, or form. So people who weren't getting access to those specs that weren't supposed to be confidentiality, that uh, the integrity of those specs remained the same, so nobody was messing with it in any shape, way, shape, or form. Or as you saw with uh, this first assignment, doing some sort of steganography and, making sh uh, and uh, adjusting the images for those bridges and so on. And then the availability, making sure that those specs were available on, on an as needed basis. So he was working in a very real time environment too. So as you can see, sysadmins are some of the most important IT personnel within an organization. So you really wanna make friends with them. So if you think about my position as a sysadmin within the microage lab, I was responsible for making sure that all of the classes, sometimes they had hundreds of students in them you know, making sure that all of their content was available to them when they needed it to be there, and it was all at a high quality. And then also, if you think about the, uh, the business my dad had, he required a systems administrator to make sure that all of the specs that he had were all uh, fit within that CIA triad we talked about. So let's talk about what systems administration is specifically. So systems administration is a set of functions that provide support services, ensures reliable operations, promotes efficient use of the system, and ensures that prescribed service quality objectives are met. So systems administration functions include installation, configuration, and maintenance of network equipment and computer systems. So network equipment could be things like switches, routers, DHCP, DNS servers, and so on. And the computer systems could be, say, things like databases, email servers, ERP systems, and that type of thing. So these kind of link with each other. So if we think about the role that I had within the microage lab, I had to regularly install new DNS or DHCP servers so that people can access the types of resources that they needed. Sometimes there was a special configuration for networking working that was required and so on. And not only that, from a configuration point of view, I had to make sure that the databases were configured the way that people wanted it to be. So the, there were certain permissions that were provided to specific types of users. So for example, the instructor of a course could get more permissions to access additional resources that the students may not be able to access. I also had to make sure that there was uptime for the database, so ensuring they have reliable operations, and also making sure that the system could be efficiently used. So for example, the type of memory that we were using, you know, we had to make sure that that was properly allocated to all the virtual machines. We had to make sure that the, you know, the machines were properly allocated. There was a ticketing system and that type of thing. And prescribed service quality objectives, we had to really understand what the key end user needs were such that we could provide services to them appropriately. Now, traditionally, if we think back all the way to the beginning of uh, you know, computing technologies and sysadmins, 
sysadmins didn't necessarily think about security up front at the beginning. Now that's obviously changed over a, over a period of time as you know networking cap capabilities have improved and that type of thing. But within a systems for a systems administrator, they're often the first line of defense for all three dimensions of the CIA triad. So let's think about the role that a systems administrator would play within a five person company like my father's. You'd think that he's the only person or that systems administrator is the only person with enough knowledge about computers or computing technologies to actually be able to effectively implement cybersecurity measures. So from a confidentiality point of view, that person had to make sure that there were appropriate file permissions that were put into place. All of the other people within the organization had to focus on the engineering tasks. They had to focus on designing bridges. They had to focus on designing specs, getting contracts with, uh, with uh, external clients, that type of thing. So they may not have the ability to use pro appropriate file permissions. They may want to just share with everyone. But that's very, very dangerous as we know from the, from the previous lecture. Integrity, they have to make sure that the quality of the data and information that's being stored is being maintained. Again, the systems administrator within a small organization has to be the one that's not only implementing, configuring, installing the systems, but they have to make sure that the integrity of the data that's on those systems is being maintained. And then finally, the availability. You have to be able to anticipate and prevent failures from affecting end users. So you have to make sure that you can access your computer and resources properly. So that's, that's really a sysadmin's relationship to a CIA triad. If you look at the smaller types of organizations, some of them may actually may not be able to uh, afford a systems administrator to do these tasks. But some of them are, and they're responsible for not only doing the basic systems administration tasks, but also for making sure that uh, they, they implement these basic cybersecurity requirements. So why exactly are we covering systems administration in this course? Systems administration is a foundational skill for aspiring information security professionals. And if we think back to the types of skills that an organization requires or that they want from an information security professional, they're looking for technical types of skills, the ability to implement and install new types of software, configure it accordingly, learn the end, end user needs and that type of thing. So most employers value these skills for entry level positions, especially for people that are know the latest and greatest technology and are able to go ahead and use that within an enterprise type of environment. Moreover, many students find systems administration skills valuable. And the reason for this is that, you know, you, you at a daily basis, when you work with your computer are doing basic types of systems administration. So for example, you may install applications on your phone. That is an aspect of systems administration. You need to know what comes along with doing that. And you can also help out maybe your aging grandparents or something like that, that, have, uh, that need to have some software installed on their machine. They may not know how to do the basic cybersecurity types of tasks and that type of thing. And they may be the ones that may be exploited, but you can help them out. Now, one thing about systems administration, uh, just from my experience when I was thrown into it, it was very, very, uh, it, was a, it was a big, big learning curve for me, that was for sure. And uh, it requires a lot of discipline and time. It can be very technical. And that's why we want to introduce it early. And now we're not gonna be doing it super hardcore. I'm just gonna be going through the, some of the basic tasks that a systems administrator has to do and why it's important in its relation to security. So the hands-on activities after each chapter is, defined, is designed to help you refine your sysadmin skills and, and your technical skills. And it's really also designed to help you put something on your resume so you can go out and you can get that next promotion at your job or go ahead and get the job within the cybersecurity field. It's tempting to skip it, but the persistence and positive attitude is really necessary in this area. And me and my TAs are completely willing to help you out in case you're struggling. So let's summarize what are the exact types of tasks that systems administrators have to conduct? So we talked about what systems administrators are, the relationship to uh, security, the uh, definition of them, you know, why are we covering that and that type of thing. But what are the exact types of tasks that systems administrators exactly have to do? Well, there's six different tasks and we'll be breaking it down at the, in the following slides. One is installation. What installation is, is writing the appropriate data in the appropriate locations 
on the uh, computer, so hard drive. So you can think about installing certain applications on your phone or certain types of uh, you know programs on your computer. So installing operating systems, application programs, and that type of thing. That is a very basic systems administration task. Configuration, selecting one amongst many possible configurations of a system. So for example, there's many of you don't know this, but there's actually a program on many Windows machines called PowerShell. Well, PowerShell is actually very powerful, but majority of end users do not need to use PowerShell. In fact, I, I, many of you may not even know what PowerShell is, but it's a huge security vulnerability. Many, many, many uh, hackers actually use PowerShell as a mechanism to hack into systems because it has so much access into the underlying parts of your computer that you can actually get significant parts and uh, control of that of machines. And I know this because I went to a Black Hat training, the Black Hat Conference 2015. I went to a two-day training on penetration testing, basically on how to hack ethically. And they were talking that PowerShell is actually one of the main mechanisms that somebody can get hacked. So configuring, how do you configure a particular piece of software so that you know, you can uh, make sure that you limit the amount of cybersecurity risk that someone may have. Access control, very, very important. So who gets access to what? A very great example of this is making sure that each student can only see their grades. Because if I don't do that, then I'm violating FERPA rules. So only making sure that the people have access to what they're allowed to have access to. And that requires a very good knowledge of the business's end goals, who is allowed to see what and when they're allowed to see it and that type of thing. User management, so it's a key component of access control. Once somebody gets in, inputted in, or hired into a company, just think about your company, if you're working at one, you have to get access to certain systems. So if you think about USF, for example, you get put on as a student, and then you get put on to the network, or you get a net ID, so you get a user manager, you're a new user, and then you're enrolled in the proper course, and you're assigned to the pro proper role, and that type of thing. Monitoring is listening or recording the activities of a system to maintain performance and security. So once people have been uh, added on, how do we actually monitor those accounts to make sure that there's no illegal activities or malicious activities that are happening? And sometimes a user may be breached and they don't even know that they've been breached. So we want to make sure that we monitor them so that they aren't, uh, they are not, so we know exactly if they've been breached or not. Finally, updating. So for this is this one pretty much stands for itself is updating the appropriate pieces of software when we need to update them. So for example, patches for the Windows operating system. So let's talk about each one a little bit more in depth. Installation is writing the necessary data in the appropriate locations on a computer's hard drive for running a software program. So installing an operating system, application programs, and that type of thing. We've all done this. We've all, all done this and that type of thing. But what I want to do is make sure you understand what the challenge is as it relates to InfoSec. The challenge is streamlining the process across thousands of computers. So when do we install? For who do we install? What do we install? I'll give you an example. When I worked at the MicroAge Lab, there were 53 workstations that I had to take care of. Imagine installing Microsoft Office on every single one of those machines manually. Now Microsoft Office can already take a long time to install, but installing on each of them manually. And then what would happen when I would need to update that? Would I have to do that manually as well? Well, fortunately, there's different technologies that are out there. And what we had used at the time was called Ghost, uh, Semantic Ghost. I don't think that's supported anymore. But that piece of software actually allowed us to install Microsoft Office on all the machines simultaneously. So the challenge is really streamlining the process, but then it gets a little bit more granular. When do we install those pieces of software? And for who do we install it for? That's the, that's the critical thing. May not, some, somebody may not need to have access to Microsoft Office. In this class, you definitely need to have access to Microsoft Office. So definitely go ahead and have that. But when do we install for who? Now, here's a key thing that will help you think a little bit more critically about information security. We as consumers often believe that when in doubt, let's just go ahead and install it because, you know, we may not know when we're going to need it. And a lot of uh, people in, in a company, they may say that, you know, we, we don't know when we're going to need a piece of software. So consumers believe that when in doubt, go ahead and install it. But 
a professional systems administrator says that when in doubt, do not install. The reason for this is that every piece of software that you install has its own vulnerabilities. Every piece of software has its vulnerabilities. When you, when you install multiple pieces of software on your machines, what happens is that you increase your vulnerability landscape. So suddenly, instead of having five vulnerabilities, when you install a new software, you may have 10 vulnerabilities. And each of those get, provides an access or a gateway for an attacker to actually make an attack and compromise a system. It only takes one vulnerability. So a systems administrator point of view, when in doubt, do not install. But you have to have a strong understanding of your end user needs and your business goals. So installation is pretty straightforward. But after that, you need to be able to configure. So after installing software, it must be configured for the business's needs. And configuration is selecting one amongst possible combinations of features of a system. It has information security implications because vulnerabilities can arise due to interactions amongst components. And sysadmins must know or the implications of these interactions. So. The challenge with this is that many software components but desired by end users are not maintained by their creators. And what I mean by this is that there may be some apps in the Android app store that you love to use, but they're not maintained by their creators anymore. A great classic example. I know, I know that some of you love windows XP. I saw it from the core surveys. However, it's no longer supported by windows or Microsoft. So the issue is, is that how do we actually configure Windows XP if we want to keep using it in a way that we minimize the vulnerabilities, but it, it still has to serve our business's needs. Moreover, we want to make sure that we select the appropriate set of configurations to make sure that we hit the end user needs while minimizing the security risk. Access control. Limiting access to information system resources only to authorized users. So we've installed software, we've configured it accordingly. And, but we want to make sure that the people who are allowed to access it are the ones that are accessing it. So the access control. And so this typically refers to files or directories that a user can read, modify, or delete. Let's take an example with this course. With Canvas, everybody has access to Canvas. You're allowed to read. You're allowed to read the types of assignments and the quizzes and that type of thing. However, you're not allowed to modify or delete them. Only I have the ability to do that. Additionally, you're not allowed to modify or delete or read everybody else's grades. Only I have the ability to do that. So access control really refers to the limitation of access to information systems resources. In this case, the grades of a class to authorized users programs, processes, or other systems. And so I have access or ability to monitor everybody, everybody's grades, read, modify, delete as, as I uh, see fit or as you, as you earn the grades. However, you may not have the ability to do that. Now this also includes limiting access to network ports. So for example, if you try to access some of the library resources while you're not on campus, you won't be able to do that. From an application point of view, this may mean that you're only allowed to see a certain amount of rows within a database or providing only certain types of screens for a business application. Now, I'm sure you can imagine the challenge is who to give access to, to what, to what extent. And again, that comes down to really understanding your business. Now, the part of the reason why I'm not summarizing some of the key ways that you can go ahead and identify what are the ways that uh, you can know your end user needs is because it really varies from, from business to business and even within an industry. How, how do you exactly know what that is? Now, there's certain types of policies that we're going to cover at the end of the class that maintain that you have to have a certain type of security posture or policies in place to make sure that these types of things are hit. But we're not going to cover that right now. We're going to cover that more towards the end of the class. User management refers to defining the rights of organizational members to information in the organization. So it's a key component of access control. So this means that it's creating and removing user accounts, updating permissions when users change roles, that type of thing. So for example, you are hired into USF, you have to be assigned a NetID, you have to be assigned a certain type of privileges, that type of thing. 
Now the challenge is how do you make, manage large numbers of users? So for example, a company like Microsoft may hire dozens if not hundreds of employees simultaneously. And they're commonly organized into groups and those groups may be users of similar privileges. So when you were added into my course, what happens is that you were all added in in bulk and all of you have similar privileges with each other. Similarly, all faculty members, say within the computer science department, are granted access to a ma mailing list. That's a particular group. Now, a common, common software, common technology that's used to manage groups is called Active Directory. So you can think about Active Directory as a directory of different people that you get to manage, that get assigned into different groups, that groups may have those types of uh, privileges associated with them. And Active Directory, Active Directory pr provides centralized user management and access control for computers. And the domain controller implements Active Directory rules in the domain. So if we think about what that means, is that I may have a domain, and that domain may be computer science faculty, and another domain may be a uh, information systems faculty. The domain controller maintains the rules for each of those faculty groups. So say, for example, that the computer science faculty have additional uh, access rights to resources within the library. The domain controller would actually provide those rules or give access and give those rules to that set of faculty, but maybe not to the information uh, systems faculty. So those are the types of things that a domain controller will do. It'll implement Active Directory rules within a domain. A domain may be a group of people and that type of thing. Monitoring is listening and or recovering, recording the activities of a system to maintain performance and security. And it's required, continue, it's required continuously after installation and configuration. So it's only something that you can do after you've installed and configured the software. And it's to ensure desired performance and security. There's two types of monitoring that occur. Number one is re re reactive, detecting and analyzing failures after, after they have occurred. So these are things like problem notifications, analyzing logs after failures. So for example, identifying modus operandi of hackers, affected systems, and that type of thing. So that would be something like malware analysis. A malware has entered your system, you've grabbed the piece of malware, and now you're analyzing that. That's a reactive type of monitoring. Proactive is testing a system for specific issues before they occur. And something like this is vulnerability scanners. So there's scanners or appliances that are out there that will actually allow you to scan a system and identify what are the vulnerabilities in there. And also penetration testing. So going into a system and purposely trying to find all of the issues associated with it and exploiting it. Penetration testing is also a form of proactive monitoring. Updating is replacing defective software components with components in which identified defects have been removed. Let's take, for example, Microsoft. How many of you actually read the service terms and the privacy policies of Microsoft? My guess is very, very few. What they say in those policies or in those areas is that their software may have many issues in them, but they have to roll it out because many times What's, what these major software uh, vendors are trying to do is that they're trying to roll out new pieces of technology. And those technologies are not necessarily defined with, uh, with security in mind. And that's really a really big issue. Now things are changing now, but the thing is, is that security is one of those investments that you don't see the effect on the bottom line right away. So therefore, organizations are rolling out these types of technologies without security built into it. And that's an issue. So when they get rolled out, security, there might be some vulnerabilities that pop up. So updates are really replacing those defective software components or updating the vulnerabilities. A typical update procedure that a systems administrator may go through within systems on their organization is to install an update on their development server Test all applications on the development system, make sure that the system is still running as seen because sometimes updates will actually break the system. And if this, if this update is successful, then deploy the update to produ production systems. Now, remember with our cyber hygiene that we talked about in the previous lecture, updating is one of the mechanisms in there. And that's something you should definitely do for your own systems for sure. But just know that within an organization, especially larger organizations, Software may be related with each other. So therefore, 
updating one aspect of it may actually break other aspects of it that you should be very well aware of. So that's something that a sysadmin constantly has to grapple with and, and, and battle with within a larger organization. There's two categories of updating. One is operating system updates. So fixing the issues with low level components of a system software. So it's developed and released by an operating system vendors. So the OS automatically checks and installs required security updates without intervention. Great example is Microsoft. They have those Wednesdays, I think it's the second Wednesday of every month where they roll out updates for all of their operating systems. Sometimes it could be a major overhaul of the operating system. Sometimes it could be a, uh, you know, just a few patches here or there. But that's at the operating system level. So it's maybe updating some of the firmware, it could be up updating some of the drivers and that type of thing. And application updates could be fixing problems with individual applications. So those could be, uh, say, Google Chrome, Microsoft Firefox, it could be Microsoft Office, that, that type of stuff, that type of thing. And they make sure that the plugins are functioning from other vendors and in-house additions. So if you think about, say, the applications on your phone, application updates would be updating, say, Facebook on your phone or LinkedIn on your phone or those types of things on your phone. And the issue with that is that the impact on the customizations that you may have is not necessarily predictable. And it could be very, very difficult to do on a large scale across an organization. How do you update all of the individual applications that users may have installed across your organization. That really comes down to the types of things you have installed on your organization. So if you think about if you allow all the consumers to install whatever they like, it becomes very, very hard to maintain the updates across all of those systems within an organization. Single points of failure are part of a system whose failure will stop the entire system from working and that's related to hardware. And the standard solution for this is redundancy. So for example, if your CPU goes out in your machine, then it, your computer's gonna go out. If your power supply goes out, then that's gonna go out. Your entire system's gonna go out. So it's a single point of failure. Now the cold spare idea is that using extra parts when necessary. So replace the failed component as quickly as possible. Let's say that you have a power supply that went down and you don't have a backup power supply, which is often the case within these smaller organizations. This will involve some downtime. You have to install the new power supply in there. So that's a cold spare. It involves downtime, but a hot spare is redundant components are already in operation that can replace the failed component. So what that means is that there may be a backup generator that you can use in the meantime while you're replacing the main power supply. So there's no downtime associated with the hot spare. And this is something you should know for your quiz is that there's a hot spare, there's no downtime with the cold spare, there is downtime associated with it because you have to take the entire system offline. Another common example you can think about is that updating the memory in your machine. For some of the machines, you have to take the entire machine offline and you have to do what, uh, a cold spare in there. With the hot spare, there's not gonna be any downtime associated with it. You can update the memory while the system is still up. So let's go ahead and summarize this common sysadmin task. We have the installation, the configuration, the access control, who gets access to what, the user management, who gets uh, into the, 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 the organization, the monitoring, so actually monitoring not only people, but also the different types of software that's installed and the network traffic and that type of thing, and also updating. So those are the summary of the, of the main sysadmin tasks. And that's actually quite a bit. That's a lot of responsibility for a sysadmin or even for a sysadmin team. And you'll get a taste of some of their activities in the assignment. So we're not just going to talk about the concept, conceptual aspect. I'm going to actually ask you to get your hands dirty and, and do some of these activities in the, in the assignment. So how do you actually streamline the process and alleviate the workload? If you think about this, a lot of this stuff is security related. A lot of it is not security related. So it's a lot of different tasks that a sysadmin has to do. So how do you actually streamline the process? So you'll get a sysadmin team sometimes if you're lucky, but not all organizations will have this. So you see that in the previous lecture that there are many roles that have come out, say a network analyst, a security architect, security analyst, and that type of thing. So a lot of sysadmin jobs have actually been broken out into many different roles. So if you think about those security roles and the demand for those positions, you can see now why it's actually become so hot and so popular. More importantly, say if you are a sysadmin within a smaller organization, but you still have to do these tasks. There's different types of software that exist within operating systems 
to aid with these tasks. So for example, within Windows, we have Active Directory that can help us manage large groups of people within an organization. You also have, say, something like Configuration Manager, the Operation Center. The so Configuration Manager may be able to help you install and configure software across an entire enterprise. An operation center will help you monitor the hardware status across your enterprise, making sure that there's no power supplies that go down and that type of thing. Within Unix and Linux, there are also like Puppet, Oracle Jumpstart, many different types of uh, technologies that are available to you to help you do a lot of these tasks that we defined above. One of the main ways to manage large amounts of servers and machines though is what's called virtualization. And virtualization is one of the main methods that a sysadmin can use to help out their, their jobs within an organization. And a virtual machine is a software container in which an operating system and applications can be installed. So here's the basic idea. Many of you right now are watching this lecture off of a laptop. And that laptop has only one operating system on it. You bought it, it has one operating system on it, and that's it. Now, a virtual machine is actually a machine that relies on a system's hardware. But the key thing about that is that you can actually install multiple virtual machines on a single piece of hardware. And the cool thing about it is that each of those virtual machines you can think about as its own little co computer. You can install its own, your own applications on there. It can be different operating systems. They all use the same hardware, but more importantly, if in case one goes down, the other one's not going to go down either. And the main technology that really makes the magic work is called a hypervisor. And it's the layer between a hardware slash OS and the virtual machine. And it manages the partitioning and isolation of system resources. So let's take a look at what, what this means. Within a traditional architecture, we can see that there's one operating system on a piece of hardware, and you can install applications on them. And that's typically what you'll see in your laptops. A hypervisor, such as VMware or Oracle VirtualBox, which you're asked to identify or download for uh, assignment two, allows multiple virtual machines to be installed. So this virtual machine right here could be a uh, Linux machine, this one could be a Windows machine, this could be a Windows XP machine, and so on and so forth. And on each of them, you can install multiple pieces of software. And this becomes particularly useful, say, if it, uh, a systems administrator is trying to handle uh, different VMs or, or different machines that are doing different tasks within an organization. All throughout my systems administration career, I had different classes that I had to uh, manage. So this could be the database class, this could be the Java class, this could be another database class, that type of thing. And so instead of having different pieces of hardware for each of those classes, I was able to install a virtual machine for each of those classes. And then those virtual machines provided services for each of the classes. So that provided me one piece of hardware and that significantly reduced the cost instead of purchasing multiple pieces of hardware. But the key drawback is, is that there's a single point of failure and it requires more computing power on one machine. But the benefits of virtualization is that it helps you save money, there's, it saves energy, it saves time, so you can actually bring up virtual machines very quickly. And in the, in the context of security, say one of those machines gets infected, you could take it down very quickly and then boot up a new one very quickly as well. It's all managed through a piece of software. And it allows for agile development. And what I mean by that is, say for example, within my research, what I did was that I, I download large amounts of hacker community data. And these also known as dark web data. And I know some of you are working with that in, uh, in your own organizations. And so some of these forums, these hacker forums that hackers congregate on, when you download them, they actually are trying to attack it. There could be pieces of malware in there. At one point, one of my VMs had over 600 viruses in it. And when I found out about that, the systems administrators within my uh, organization were very, very upset with me, of course. But what I did was I was able to take that VM down very, very quickly and just bring up a new one, bring up a clean one, a new one that I was able to go ahead and download more hacker community data. And I was able to very agilely develop uh, my, my software that I needed to analyze those pieces of uh, data that I was collecting from the online hacker community. 
Additionally, it provides uh, organizations what's called infrastructure as a service. So if you think about a cloud computing company such as the Amazon Web Services, they allow you to rent infrastructure with operating systems already installed, configured, updating without having it on your premises. So this can be huge benefits. And we were seeing a lot of systems administrators go this route because if you think about all of the tasks that an organization has to do or a sysadmin has to do, that is very, very cumbersome in a lot of ways. So the installation, configuration, the monitoring and updating, that's something that a cloud service provider can actually do for a systems administrator. Amazon Web Services will actually monitor to make sure that you're not breached in any way, shape or form. And they can help you out significantly. They'll provide you alerts that you need to make sure that you have not been breached. They can also install the pieces of software. There's different uh, Amazon Web Service containers that provide Windows installed or something like that, that will actually significantly alleviate the workload that a systems administrator has to have within their organization. So you can think about infrastructure as a service as infrastructure as a service. It is infrastructure that you can go ahead and purchase from a major cloud vendor. There's also software as a service, renting software, platform as a service, renting platforms, that type of thing. We won't talk about them, this in this lecture, just know that these are options. So let's talk about the different types of operating systems that you can actually install, whether it be from a cloud computing uh, provider or uh, on virtual machines and, and that type of thing, or across your organization. Windows 7, Windows 10, a Mac OS, Linux, those are some of the most popular desktop operating systems. But let's think back to the last lecture. It's not just important to know about the desktop architectures that are out there, but we also need to know about the mobile ones that are, to, that are out there too. And the reason for this is that, remember in 2012, if we think back of the timeline of activities uh, within the information security uh, community, 2012 really marked the first time that the number of mobile computing devices or mobile uh, devices exceeded the number of desktop devices that are out there. And if we break down the mobile operating systems market share, Android dominates with 67%. And then there's another one, 30%, which is iOS. And you can see the operating system uh, versions. Now, here's the key thing that I want to point out. These breakdowns may vary based off of industry. Certain industries may be more Windows-based. Some of them may be more Mac OS-based. It really depends on your industry and your organization as well, what the operating systems are. And it's up to the systems administrator to be able to execute those tasks on those particular devices. One of the most popular uh, operating systems for systems administrators is Linux. And although Windows is the most dominant OS for consumers, Linux is often preferred amongst many systems administrators and security professionals. And you may ask yourself the question, why? Well, let's think about the breakdown of what a consumer has to do versus what a uh, Linux or what a systems administrator has to do. A consumer is often interested in, say, you know, just using the software to execute the end business tasks. Say within banking, they want to use certain pieces of software that will help them get the reports out or access databases of financial records and that type of thing. They might, may not need to know the underlying technology that's there. They may not need to customize anything. They may not have to download any types of uh, software or configure that software, install that software, or access management or user management or any of those things. In fact, many times consumers don't have to do any of that. However, a systems administrator have to do that. That's, no, that's not a choice for them. And Linux is an open source piece of software. As you saw with the previous uh, slide about what are the common systems administrator tasks, they have to do all of these tasks. Linux really provides a mechanism for people to go ahead and do all of those tasks pretty easily. Now, Windows does that too, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong on that whatsoever. But there, but there are certain types of Linux distributions that are designed specifically for security professionals. One of them is like Kali Linux. It's a, it's a Linux distribution that has many hacking tools built into it. Vulnerability scanners, penetration testing scanners, uh, different types of uh, network scanners and network sniffers, packet sniffers, that type of thing that's built into it. I myself have built up a, my own type of security Linux box called ISI Linux, Intelligence and Security Informatics Linux, which what it, what it is is that it's a set of analytics software that's built in to help 
security professionals that are interested in analytics start to analyze large amounts of security data. So I myself have actually built a Linux distribution specific to the tasks that I need. And systems administrator tasks, they have to be tinkerers. They have to be hackers in their own way. They have to think like black hat hackers in a lot of ways, and they have to build up certain types of technologies that will help them do tasks very effectively. Because if we go back and look at all the tasks that a systems administrator has to do, that's a lot of stuff that they have to do. So they have to build up different types of tools that are available that can help them execute their own tasks. There's also Tails, which is a certain type of Linux distribution, Hunix, and so on. And many of them are developed just for cybersecurity applications, just for systems administration applications. If we look at the history of Linux, it really is from the Unix family. It was developed by uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie in 1969. You'll need to know this for the quiz. So, and there's many different flavors of Linux that are out there. For the most part, they're, they're open source, but there are other ones that, are a little, that have some costs associated with it, such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And you can see that the Mac OS X is actually a derivative of Unix. Within this class, we've developed a specialized Linux machine just for this course. And you're going to install it using Oracle VirtualBox. And that is a virtualization software. It's really supposed to give you a hands-on uh, view of what systems administrators often have to do. Now, you'll be installing it using Oracle VirtualBox. There's an installation tutorial video provided on Canvas. And there's also a, uh, a, uh, a set of instructions at the end of Chapter 2 available to you as well. And it's a virtual server. Once you've installed it, you'll be prompted for a username and password. Unfortunately, I can't provide it for you here. It'd be a massive security violation. But you can refer to page 47 for the textbook, uh, uh, of the textbook for login credentials. And the next lecture will provide a detailed Linux overview and walkthrough. So we talked about those different types of tasks that a systems administrator has to do and how it relates with cybersecurity. We'll actually go through and do some of those tasks hands-on. I'll give you a walkthrough of how to do that. So some of the review questions, and these are not all of the review questions, I strongly urge that you read the chapter because the lecture is just meant to give you a stepping stone through the lecture or through the, through the chapter and summarize the key points. But systems administration is really, really important. Uh, they're often the first line of defense within information security. Some of the important day-to-day -day activities provided by systems administrators are installation, configuration, user management, uh, access control, that type of thing. And it, they're really important for the CIA triad. They're the, they're the first line of defense. Uh, they, they do a lot of important activities that we had just mentioned for maintaining security as well as day-to-day -day IT operations for an organization. Some of the benefits of virtualization that make, makes a systems administrator's job a lot easier. They're able to install pieces of software, configure them very, very effectively, very quickly, uh, and on a large scale as well. And Linux is one of the popular distributions that are out there that, uh, that actually allows a uh, systems administrator to do a lot of their tasks very effectively, customize pieces of software, it's open source, gives them access to a lot of different tools and resources that they need in order to execute their job. And some of the most popular distributions are, say, uh, Ubuntu or Red Hat and that type of thing, but also know that there are cybersecurity-specific Linux distributions that you can create yourself that are also available for download. As always, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thanks.